Hey everyone, uh, my name is Ankush. I'm co-founder of a company called Linktrain. We're a small 20-person uh, startup uh, and we're focused on um, helping people develop applications with LLMs. Um, I'll be talking about how we built our first product called Langsmith, which is a tool for LLM application observability, uh, prototyping, and uh, evaluation, and how we're using uh, ClickHouse uh, to run Langsmith at scale. Uh, actually just launched Langsmith under uh, general availability three weeks ago. A uh, big part of that was due to us uh, uh, integrating with ClickHouse and ClickHouse Cloud. So really uh, thankful to the team um, for, for all the work uh, with us on, on that project. So in this talk, I'll probably um, you know, give you a quick walkthrough of Langsmith. Uh, maybe at the end, I can do a quick demo as well. And then I'll walk through how we're using uh, ClickHouse um, uh, to ingest and read data. So Langsmith is, uh, as I mentioned, it's an all-in-one uh, developer platform for building with LLMs. Uh, we have a number of different workflows for assisting people in LLM application development at all parts of the LLM application development cycle. Um, this includes prototyping, beta testing, and production. So I'll walk through some of the workflows right now. So when you're prototyping, uh, uh, LLM applications, the first thing that you might want to do is debug, right? Uh, LLMs are, uh, LLM applications are notoriously hard to debug uh, because they're, they're um, uh, you know, in a lot of ways they're non-deterministic. Lots of tools that you might want to interface your LLM with, and they can produce different results at different times. Uh, you might run into issues where your LLMs are using, your LLM applications using more tokens than you want. You could be running into, um, you know, like infinite loops if you're using agentic workflows. So it's really important to have some good foundational debugging uh, when, you're, when you're building with LLM applications. And initially when we first launched Langsmith under uh, private beta, we were intending it to be just a debugging tool. Um, this is part of the reason why we decided to build with Postgres initially, and then when we moved more into the LLM observability and analytics space, we decided to back uh, Langsmith with ClickHouse instead of Postgres. So uh, here's just like a rendering of uh, uh, a trace that you might want to send to Langsmith and how it looks. Uh, you can, in this case, this is a, a chat pipeline it's answering questions about Langchain's Python documentation, um, and it's doing a retrieval step and then doing a generation step to answer the question based on the context that are retrieved from the documents. The next thing that you might wanna do in the prototyping phase is build an initial test set uh, for testing your LLM application. So a lot of times developers you know, ship their LLM applications on vibe checks, but it's really important to build some type of initial data set of golden queries that you can use to test your LLM pipeline against before you send it to production. And so here, um, you know, you can create a data set. Data sets are nothing more than examples, a list of examples. Each example is a reference input and output. Um, that you can use to uh, grade your LLM, your actual output against. Once you've run some tests, it's, it's really important to understand how your test results are, are looking or stacking up against each other. So we offer some uh, good tools that allow you to compare test results across a number of criteria. So if you're running LLM assisted evaluations or um, heuristic based evaluations, you can uh, look at these aggregate metrics, and you can also look at things like latency and token usage across your tests as well. All right, um, I'll move over to the beta testing phase. Um, once you are in beta, right? let's say you have an LM application and you've shipped it to an initial set of users, what you might wanna do is rely on uh, you know, human feedback and human labeling to understand how your LM application is doing in the real world. So oftentimes um, you'll get feedback that's sent up with your LM application, either in the form of a thumbs, down, a thumbs up or a thumbs down button. 
And then we also offer a mechanism for you to hook into uh, human annotators to uh, assess your traces, your trace outputs based on a number of different criteria that are important for you and your organization. These annotators don't necessarily have to be your dev team. They can be anyone um, uh, uh, who's like a domain expert in your in your company. The other thing that, we, that you might want to do is grow the um, test sets that you created in the prototyping phase with the real data that you're getting in beta testing. So when you're first developing your LM application, you can't really get a good understanding of how the users are going to use it out in the real world. So once you get a good understanding of how your LM application is performing uh, in real world scenarios, you can take the most interesting inputs and outputs that you're getting in beta testing or even production and then add them to data sets. Once you have a growing um, set of, of, of data sets uh, where each data set is getting more examples from real world scenarios, you'll be able to build up like really good defense against uh, future regressions that, we, that you might want to introduce, especially as you play around with the model or the prompt or uh, any other setting uh, that, you, that you can configure. The last thing that I'll get into is uh, monitoring and AP testing. This is a use case that we've seen uh, explode in LLM uh, application development. This is because there's so many different knobs that you can, that you can tune in your LLM pipeline. So you can tune like the retrieval strategy, you can tune the prompt, um, you can change the model that you're using. Additionally, you can do this at different steps of your LLM pipeline. So the number of different configurations from your, for, for your application is, is quite possibly like endless. So instead of trying out all of these different scenarios just at test time, it's important for developers to get a good idea of what's actually happening out in the real world. So it's really important to either launch multiple versions of your application at the same time or have one, um, another, another common pattern we've seen is have one, one version of your application actually serve the traffic and then shadow the inputs to other versions of your application that might have different retrieval strategies, different look back windows, different model choices, different prompts, um, things of that nature. And then we have some good uh, you know, features in Langsmith that allow you to see how different versions of your application uh, are doing. Um, it's really like the last use case that uh, triggered our need to move up a Postgres onto something that would allow us to scale to um, uh, this new phase of LLM application development where people are not just tinkering with LLMs, but really starting to put these systems into production. What were the requirements? Well, one is we needed high uh, throughput ingest. Um, we're still a small company, 20 people. Uh, 80K runs per second might not sound like much, but for us, it was it's quite a bit of <laughs> quite a bit of load for a small team. Um, and uh, we were, you know, we were running into scaling issues with Postgres. Um, There's quite a lot of data for Postgres. Um, and so we needed to look for alternatives. The other, day, uh, the other uh, piece of this is analytical workloads. We wanted to uh, give people a very good understanding of their aggregate token counts or um, their, their feedback scores, um, evaluation results, things like that. So we needed to offer uh, fast, accurate um, analytics for people uh, to assess how their LM pipelines are doing in uh, production. As I mentioned, as we accumulate more and more data from, from, from people uh, who are sending their traces to us, we needed better ways of storing that data, and uh, compression was another big thing for us. Additionally, we didn't want to introduce a lot of infrastructure complexity. We didn't have Kafka, um, and we didn't, you know, we didn't want to introduce like other uh, you know, you know, queuing uh, mechanisms into our infrastructure. So ClickHouse supports like regular ins insert syntax. It has um, async inserts that you can use uh, and you can just like plug into and uh, you, didn't ha you don't have to make like any other changes. The other thing is we have a need for supporting updates in some cases. So some people send us you know, the first half of the run when the input is when the input is sent to the LM pipeline, and then they patch it with the output and the end time 
and other uh, and other fields later on. So we have uh, a need for a one-time update for certain for certain data. And ClickHouse supports uh, a replacing uh, merge tree engine that allows you to have duplicates and then it will merge those duplicates um, in the background. And then the last piece is performance. Um, we needed high performance ingest, high performance analytics. Uh, ClickHouse was just like the fastest option for us. So in the rest of this talk, I'll discuss some uh, some of the things that we're doing behind the scenes to get the most out of ClickHouse for our for our benefit. And the hope is that maybe this helps someone. Um, and I'm also <laughs> I'm also uh, uh, open to any comments or suggestions that that people have, especially if you're running ClickHouse for similar use cases. Um, so the first thing that we did is. As I mentioned, we didn't want to introduce additional infrastructure. We didn't want to do batching ourselves. We really uh, liked the async insert setting that ClickHouse offered. So all you have to do is set a single flag, async insert equals one. And uh, what happens behind the scenes is your data gets inserted into a buffer table. And depending on the settings that you've configured in ClickHouse, that buffer is flush to the main table, either um, every, uh, uh, you know, with like a time-based frequency or a database, you could a, a data-based frequency, so you can have uh, like a max size uh, for for your buffer as well, I believe. The other thing that we that we did is um, we actually we actually like uh, queue up our writes uh, to the API server, and uh, we have uh, the wait for async insert flag equal to one, which allows us to do retries and it's it's also uh, better for monitoring in case there's an error down the line um, that and, and that way we'd be notified of, of any drop data. The second thing that I want to talk about is how we leverage materialized views for speeding up filtering by different attributes. In our application we need to, we have a few different workflows that we support for viewing your data. When you first log into the application and you view traces for, for a particular bucket, you get this table. Um, you get this, uh, yeah, table-based view that shows you all the traces for a particular time period. The traces are tied to a uh, tenant in a project. We have a need for showing all of the root traces for a particular tenant and project, and just listing all of them, right? However, as you saw in the, one of the first slides, we also have a trace view that shows all the runs in a particular trace or all the spans in a particular trace. We call them runs, run spans, similar concepts if you're familiar with OTEL. We also had to do this with a few other views um, and you know it's the same idea. So the solution is for us is we duplicated our data using materialized views and stored, um, stored all the rows, not all the columns, but all the rows in another table. And we use the materialized view as a trigger for uh, populating the destination table. Then we sorted by other columns, so we were able to change the sorting key. So every ClickHouse table has a sorting key um, that you define, and it allows you to look up your data uh, in an efficient manner, right? Um, however, if you're sometimes querying for things that are not in that sorting key, that's when you might run into like efficiency issues, right? columns that we kept in the destination tables were actually the sorting keys of the original table. So we could do a very fast lookup in the in one of the destination tables that contained, for example, trace ID in the sorting key, and then we would get the sorting key values of the original table. And then we would do a lookup in the original table and both queries were extremely efficient. So we call like the destination tables like narrow tables because they don't contain all of the columns in the uh, in the original table. We also used a flag called parallel view processing uh, to uh, insert into all the materialized views in parallel. This just makes things a little bit more efficient. So here is um, I've redacted some of the some of the columns and actually all the columns in our table. Uh, but uh, we have a we're using uh, ClickHouse Cloud actually. Um, and they have a shared uh, replacing merge tree engine. And the two arguments to uh, any replacing merge tree engine are the, um, 
so, so the first argument is modified at, which means that if there are duplicates in the table, we would keep the one with the most recent modified at, right? And then we can op optionally also pass in uh, a field that would indicate whether or not this row is meant to be deleted and which ClickHouse will, will handle in the background with the replacing merge tree engine. So in our sorting key here, we have tenant ID, session ID, which does an alias for project in our case, is root, uh, start time uh, ID. And this, is, this works really well for a default view for traces. The reason why we need to keep ID here is uh, for the replacing merge tree engine to, uh, uh, I guess, delete uh, or get rid of duplicates uh, in the background. So basically rows with the same sorting key would be merged uh, in the background into one row. This is one of our destination tables. Uh, it's, it, it has uh, an attribute called trace ID in the, in the sorting key. So what we're able to do here is for a particular tenant and session, pull up all of the spans for that particular trace. And this works very well, uh, very well for us. And as you can see, um, all the columns in this table are actually in the sorting key of the original table. And the other thing that, uh, the other trick that we're doing um, behind the scenes is, so when you're using a replacing merge tree engine and you want to make sure that no duplicates exist when you're querying the data, you can use a keyword final and it will issue um, it will issue. It will basically merge duplicates at query time. Um, however, uh, to be more efficient, if you know that the result of your query isn't going to isn't going to produce a ton of rows, you can actually do an order by ID modified at. Uh, uh, so you do you can order by these two fields and then limit one by ID. And this this only works if you don't have. If you know you're not going to return, be returning a ton of data, um, but it works actually uh, very well for our use case. Uh, the other thing that I'll that I'll discuss is um, a way that we that we've made joins like a lot more efficient. Uh, we push down the filters. Um, I'll explain like what this is doing at a high level. So we actually have a bunch of attributes that you can filter by in the um, in the trace view, right? So we actually allow people to send arbitrary metadata along with each along with each trace. We want people to be able to filter by these, you know, arbitrary fields in the metadata. So we actually expand those in a materialized view uh, to make them efficient for filtering, and then we can join um, on the original table. If you uh, do a filter pushdown, your joins actually become like a lot more efficient. So this was like also a big unlock for us. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, we are hiring. Uh, we're a small company. If you're interested in LM application development, uh, let me know. Um, we'd love to speak to you. Uh, we're also, you know, noobs when it comes to ClickHouse. It's a technology that I've been that that our team has been working with for uh, only a few months now. So if you have any suggestions, comments, um, you know, please, please let us know. Um, yeah, happy to answer any questions now.